Hello everyone, my name is Rachel Newville, and today I will be giving a pre-concert analysis of Hermit Songs by Samuel Barber. So, who was Samuel Barber? Samuel Barber was an American composer with the heart of an Irishman. His mother was from an Irish family, and his father was from a Scottish family. This ancestry enabled Barber to develop an interest in Irish poetry at a young age. Similar to many of his contemporaries and predecessors, Barber began writing music at a very young age. He composed his first musical work at age seven and attempted composing his first opera at age 10. By the time he was 14, he was enrolled at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia, where he studied piano, voice, conducting, and composition. Barber wrote music that he felt, music that came out of him naturally, and this style of composition earned him two Pulitzer Prizes. What is hermitage and who are these hermits? Hermitage is a term for pure isolation for the purpose of devoting all of one's focus to a singular line of study. Oftentimes when an academic is working on something, they will seclude themselves to devote themselves to their work. Another variation of this, more common many centuries ago, was devotion to the church through becoming a nun or a monk. These monks and scholars whose texts are used in this song cycle were of the 8th to 13th centuries and wrote these in their personal notebooks or, in the case of some of the monks, on the covers of the illuminated manuscripts which were discovered centuries later. Where did these texts come from? Prior to selecting these poems and setting them to music, Barber had visited Ireland to explore the homes of some of his favorite poets, such as William Yeats and James Joyce. While in Ireland, he found the tombstones of several other barbers to whom he thinks he could have been related. The poems were originally written in Gaelic, so Barber had to navigate, and in some cases commission, the translations of these texts so he could understand them. He was fond of the purity of the text, and he liked that they all seemed to have been written in a state of solitude and seclusion, a theme which was frequently present in a majority of his works. One thing that stands out about these texts is the fact that they don't rhyme, in English at least. They're all translated from Gaelic, so while meter was considered in the translations, rhyme was not. When we get to Church Bell at Night, we'll talk about one of the traditional Irish poetry traditions. The songs are performed in the following order. At St. Patrick's Purgatory, Church Bell at Night, St. Ida's Vision, The Heavenly Banquet, The Crucifixion, Sea Snatch, Promiscuity, The Monk and His Cat, The Praises of God, and The Desire for Heritage. The premiere with Leontine Price. Leontine Price was the soprano Barber chose to perform the debut of his song cycle at the Library of Congress in 1954. She was well known for her early stage and television work. She made her opera debut at the Metropolitan Opera House in 1961 and was one of the first African American women to gain international fame as an opera singer. With such an honor, she was able to be selective with the roles she performed. Though she retired after her role in Aida in 1985, she came out of retirement briefly in 2001 to perform a tribute to the victims of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. In the years after her retirement, she continued to perform recitals, but accepted no major roles of any kind. Now, as we move on to discuss each of the songs individually, please note that you'll see a little eighth note next to some things. Those are things to listen for during each of the songs. St. Patrick's Purgatory. It's a real place, but what is it? St. Patrick's Purgatory is an island in Ireland's Loch Derg. It's a location that many go to for pilgrimages as a way to find themselves and rededicate themselves. The way Barbara wrote the piano melody creates the aesthetic of a ship rocking in the water. The steady eighth note rhythm of the piano establishes that the storyteller is moving on a pilgrimage to Loch Derg, as is said in the text. The middle section of the song, when Christ is mentioned, the singer's melody transitions from syncopated 
to straight rhythm, mirroring an attitude of respect and adoration, as opposed to the unsureness of the syncopation. bell at night. This is the shortest poem and song in the cycle. There's a feeling of secrecy in this song. The soft dynamics of both the piano and the voice suggest sneaking around, but in a manner that lines up with the lifestyle of a hermit. The narrator says that they would rather rendezvous with a church bell than with a light and foolish woman. The song moves along quietly, mirroring the idea of a secret rendezvous, a forbidden love. The early Irish rhyming style included using a word from the end of the previous phrase in the next line. For example, in a translation done by Ruth Lehman, Sweet wee bell, that bell would I rather meet, then meet a woman sinning. Barber used his creative license to alter this poetic form in favor of the musical alignment. Saint Ida's vision. Who was she? Saint Ida was a monastic nun born in 475 AD who was expected to marry, but was granted her father's blessing to become a nun after fasting and praying for three days and three nights. It is said that she frequently cared for the sick and once cured a blind man. This poem reflects her desire to be a holy figure. She was so dedicated to her religion that she wished to be a part of its history. And as is said in the song, she wished to be granted a holy son, just as Mary had. The vocal melody is very disjunct and mimics the pure desire of the narrator to bear the child of God through its crescendo throughout the song. At the mention of baby Jesus, the melody becomes soft and tranquil, much like a lullaby, which Ida would sing to the child Christ. Heavenly Banquet. The Heavenly Banquet is a satirical, upbeat, and exciting song about the fantasy of feeding and entertaining a number of heavenly names, such as the Three Marys and the King of Kings, for whom she would like to provide a lake of beer. Both the piano and voice are bouncy in their eighth note rhythms with slurs and staccatos mixed in with each other. As the poem mentions who all would be invited to this banquet, the image of the Last Supper is created with the names listed in the song rather than the original Twelve Disciples. The setting of this poem is intended to reflect the creativity of the thought of preparing a never-ending feast for the heavenly family. The Crucifixion On the other end of the emotion spectrum, and perhaps one of the most frequently performed songs in this cycle, The Crucifixion tells the painful story of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The dissonance of the piano establishes the sorrowful mourning of Christ's sacrifice. The legato vocal line imitates the weeping of the women who watched him suffer. This is a haunting reflection of the salvation of humanity and some of the emotions that Jesus' followers experienced. The poem describes the death as being like the parting of day from night. 
hinting at how wrong it was for Jesus to be sacrificed for the sake of humanity. This poem also addresses that the most painful part of the sacrifice to Jesus was the pain that his mother experienced. Sea Snatch. The tempo marking of this song is allegro con fuoco, surging, and is, therefore, very fast rhythmically and textually. The rushed tempo paired with the constantly moving eighth notes could almost make the listener seasick from all of the motion. The shortest song in the cycle in length of time, this song lasts around 30 seconds and is only a mere 31 measures. Both the voice and piano depict the feeling of tempestuous waves of the ocean crushing a small boat. The vocal line in particular sounds like a crewmate on a ship being tossed about by the waves. Let's listen to the way Barbara expands on this feeling using the same text twice with similar melodies. Here he, here is the first time. Let's hear what he does the second time. This text was taken from the 8th century accumulation of poetry and prose, a Celtic miscellany compiled by Kenneth Jackson. Barbara uses this book for several of the other poems hereafter. Promiscuity. Only ten measures long, Promiscuity, the seventh song, is very brief and leaves the listener with several questions from merely a two-line prose. Scholars have suggested that perhaps the subject of the work is a monk who is disobeying his vows, and this is simply an anonymous commentary of an observation. The dissonance of the piano line create an uneasy, questioning tone for the curiosity of the vocal melody and text. The piano plays in unison with the voice. This creates the feeling of sneaking around and trying to blend into the background so as not to be seen. Let's listen to what the original Gaelic poetry would have sounded like. Ni fetar sia lasa fifia etan, acht rofetar etan bian. Nikon Fifea A Wenaran and his cat. The most well known of all the songs in this cycle, The Monk and His Cat is playful in its composition, with ascending dissonant chords in the piano, which are used to depict a cat walking up the keyboard of the piano. The original title of this text was Pangurban, meaning White Panger, which was the name of the scholar's cat. This song narrates the similarities between the scholar's focus on his studies and the cat's focus on its hunting. It expresses the contentment with their relationship and how neither bothers the other's work, and they both live happily together in isolated harmony. Pictured below is the dissonant chords ascending that represent the cat. Let's see what that sounds like. Praises of God. The narrator claims that he who does not raise his voice to sing praises to God is foolish. It states that such an action is so simple that even the birds sing all day, everywhere. In other words, if you can praise God, why wouldn't you? There's no explanation given for why one should praise God other than an 11th century why not. On the word laudations, Barbara uses an extended melisma the first time it is said, and then a flourished version of the original melisma. The significance of this is that melismas are usually intended to draw attention to the word being sung, and in this case, it feels like the singer is taunting anyone not singing laudations. Just like in Sea Snatch, 
Barbara repeats a text and melodic line, but modifies it to add emphasis to the word. Listen for how he expands the melisma on laudations. You can also hear the piano bouncing around underneath the vocal line. It feels like it's trying to gather attention for the singer. The Desire for Hermitage The final song of the cycle, The Desire for Hermitage, ties up the entire work and relates everything back to its descriptive name, Hermit Songs. This poem may have been particularly special to Barber because he valued the concept of hermitage and seclusion. In many early Irish monasteries, there were individual huts which were called hermitages. This could be another variation of the title that the poet was wishing he could return to his hermitage and to his secluded study. The vocal melody is centered around G4, right above middle C. The monotone feeling of this pitch center gives more emphasis to the text and allows the listener to focus on what is being said, particularly on the lines of text that are most significant, such as the last line of the song, Alone I came into the world, and alone I shall go from it. The song mentions being alone in a cell, where presumably one would have ample time to think and dwell in one's thoughts. In the middle of this song, there's a piano interlude that is followed by the singer restating, ah, to be alone in a little cell. During this interlude, Barber does not use a meter. He instead allows the piano to play more freely and without a sense of a strong beat or a downbeat. Let's take a second and listen to that. The song leaves the audience with something to think about in the last line. Alone I came into the world, and alone I shall go from it. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed.